good. And, you know, really, I love the summer season. Uh, I, I just, I love this season. For me, it's, it's just a refreshing time. I know many of us are going to be traveling, taking vacations. And, and I just want to encourage you, as I did last week, in this summer season, be refreshed. Be around your family and your friends and, and maybe do things you don't normally do September through June because of that rhythm. But always put God first, everybody. Right? I say it again. Always put God first in our lives and, and seek him in the morning and, and just discover what he has to say. And we're excited for this series. We really feel like with the summertime, it's a good time to just kind of look around scripture, almost not in any specific order, but what's going to keep us all together throughout this series is we're going to look at parables. And, and what parables are, I like to say it this way, they're earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus told so many parables, dozens of parables that were, they were earthly in their storytelling, like his audience could relate to what he was saying, but he wasn't just saying what he was saying. <laughs> he was saying something more. And really the big theme of, of most of Jesus's parables, and this is what's going to carry us through the summer, is here's what the kingdom of God is like, and here's how you live because you're a part of his kingdom. See, when Jesus came to this world, he ushered in the kingdom of God, God's kingdom and its values and its principles. As he said, I came to give abundant life. And so he told these stories to help us understand, well, this is my kingdom. And so for these six weeks, you're going to hear from me and, and everyone on our preaching team to discover some of these stories and discover what God's kingdom is like. Now, as I'm saying this, I could see a whole lot of us are a whole lot confused. And so I'm going to stop talking for the next five minutes. And we're going to watch a video together by The Bible Project. And if you're not familiar with The Bible Project, I encourage you, look them up, use their resources. They have great stuff, as you're about to see. I thought on our first Sunday together, why not get on the same page and discover what a parable is? Take a look at the screen, and then we'll jump into our first parable together. Jesus of Nazareth was a master teacher, and some of his most well-known teachings are told in short stories called parables. Yeah, like the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who was looking for pearls, and when he found the ultimate pearl, he sold everything so that he could buy it. Must have been some pretty amazing pearl. Or the kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed that a farmer planted in his garden. It grew and became a huge tree, and birds came to perch in its branches. And that's a beautiful image, but what does it mean? Exactly. Jesus didn't tell parables to make everything clear. Rather, he wanted to provoke the imagination and invite people to see what God is doing in the world from a new perspective. So let's talk about how to read the parables of Jesus. Now there's many great teachers that throughout history have used stories to teach students about morality, religion, philosophy. But Jesus didn't use his parables to teach abstract religious or moral ideals. He said that his parables were about himself and his mission. His mission, which was to announce that the kingdom of God was arriving on earth as it is in heaven. Right. So in Jesus' day, the Israelites were ruled by the Roman Empire. But their scriptures promised that one day their God would come to rule his people as king. And so many Israelites wanted to revolt against Rome and fight for their freedom. And this is what some people thought of as the kingdom of God. Exactly. But Jesus was a poor traveling prophet, healing the sick, inviting people to follow him. And he said that this was the arrival of God's kingdom. And that didn't fit people's expectations. Right. And so Jesus used some parables to help people imagine that his small movement was the arrival of God's kingdom. Oh yeah, like the parable that the kingdom of God is yeast hidden in a lump of dough. And you might not see its influence, but it's going to change everything. Jesus also told parables about the upside down values of God's kingdom, about how the least important people in the world are actually the most important people to God, especially those who are poor and of low status. Yeah, like the parable about the business owner who hired workers throughout the day, in the morning, later in the day, and even towards the end of the day. And when it was time to pay everyone, he paid them all the same wage. Right, Jesus is showing how money and status are irrelevant to God, who offers his generous mercy to everybody. Now, not all of the parables have happy endings. Some are really intense. Yes, Jesus stood in the tradition of Israel's prophets, who also told parables to criticize Israel's leaders because they mistook their kingdom for God's. 
So Jesus warned the leaders of his day, if they don't accept his offer of God's kingdom, they're headed for destruction. Yeah, like the parable of the landowner who built a wonderful vineyard and he expects it to produce fruit. Yes, Jesus gets this parable from the prophet Isaiah, but then he adapts it. Right, and so the landowner appoints managers to take care of this vineyard. And at harvest, he sends servants to collect the fruit, but those managers kill the servants. And so the landowner sends his own son to confront the managers and they kill him too. And so Jesus asked the people around him, what do you all think this landowner should do? Oh, he's going to punish those managers and hire new ones. Jesus knew that if Israel kept on their current path, they would be destroyed by Rome. And so in parables like this, he's forcing people to make a decision about his offer of God's kingdom. Are people going to reject him, ignore him, or trust and follow him? Now, if this message of God's kingdom is so important, why cloak it in parables? Why not be more clear? Well, through riddles and parables, Jesus could make really bold claims that revealed truth to people who were open-minded. For those who have ears to hear, they could ponder it and go deeper. But the parables would also conceal his message from those who were against him so that he could buy more time. Buy time for what? Well, Jesus was preparing his closest followers for the greatest surprise yet. Jesus claimed that Israel's God was coming to rule over his people, not through coercion or violent force, but through self-giving love as he was going to die for their sins. But his death wasn't the end. Right. He said that his death would be like a tiny seed buried in the ground, but then it would grow and produce a crop with many seeds. So these parables, they explain who Jesus was and what he was up to. And the gospel authors have preserved these parables so that now every generation of Jesus' followers can read and ponder them. And imagine how God's kingdom is still at work even today. Right. These ancient parables are still full of new surprises and challenges. They're like a storehouse packed with treasures, some that are new, some that are old, and it's all just waiting to be discovered. All right. Who wants to discover it? All right, we're going to discover it whether or not you want to. That's what we're going to do for the next six weeks. Uh, if you notice, something I like that they said, which is what I want us to say every single week together as we get started reading, is they talked about people who have ears to hear. And that's such a great prayer to say together. God, give me ears to hear. So we're about to read a parable, and you're going to see it's very earthly in its nature. It's about a wedding party. But if God would give us ears to hear this morning, then we would see what he actually wants to show us and hear what he actually wants to say. So would you say this prayer with me? Say with me, Jesus, give me ears to hear. Awesome. I believe he's going to answer that prayer. So we're going to read from Matthew and from Luke this morning because this parable is recorded in both of those books. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Luke is the third book of the New Testament. And by reading from both of them, we're going to get a clear, big picture of the parable that Jesus told. Now, what you need to know before we read the words is where Jesus was. At this point, when he's telling this parable, he is at a very prominent religious leader's house. So he's not out in the streets, he's not out in the fields, he's not on some mountain. He is inside a home, and the home that he's at is a religious leader known as a Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader. Now, why that matters is because in this day, a little different than our day, who you invited into your home and who said yes to the invitation actually spoke to your reputation as the homeowner. So if you can invite someone of status, who Jesus was, into your home for a meal, and he actually said yes, that's a big deal to the person inviting. So just keep that in mind because Jesus is now going to share a parable that has to do with invitation. So here's how it starts in Matthew. Matthew 22 Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So how many know here on Long Island, when we do weddings, we do big weddings, right? We go bankrupt over them. I'm not advocating this. I'm just stating the fact. That just seems to be what happens. I, I, it's $20,000 ahead. That's okay. We'll figure it out later. We have our marriage to figure that out. 
Uh, but we do, we do big weddings. We do big celebrations. Now, with all of that Long Island knowledge, understand this, Jesus says in his story, again, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is like a king who's going to do a wedding banquet. You better believe the king's wedding banquet is going to put to shame a Long Island wedding banquet. I mean, this is going to be massive. If you get an invitation to this, you've got some worth to be invited. I mean, you better show up with a big gift for the king's son. So here's Jesus inside the religious leader's home, and he says, oh, let me tell you a story to explain the kingdom of God. It's like a king who puts on a wedding banquet for his son. And it says this in the next verse, he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Something else culturally we need to understand. At this time, when you were invited to a wedding banquet, you got two invitations. Now, we kind of understand this because what do we get usually when someone's having a save the date, right? You, you got to save the date, which is kind of your invitation of, hey, I'm inviting you. Here's the date. Just want you to know. And, and you, know, you, you let them know. But then you'll get another invitation where you check off if you want the fish, the steak, the chicken, like, you know, like that part. So here in, in Jesus' day, there's two invitations that go out. Now understand, when the first invitation goes out and you say yes, that's a big deal to the king or to the person throwing the banquet. So look at what Jesus says. It's like, it's like a king put on a banquet and he sent out the invitation, the second invitation, to those who were already invited and said, hey, remember when you guys said you were coming to the banquet? Well, guess what? It's ready. And they refused to come. Now, the same way that being invited to a banquet and going puts honor on the host, saying no is shameful to the host. You don't want to be the host that invited a whole lot of people and then they're saying, no, I can't come. No, I mean, this, is, this is shaming in this culture to say no. They refuse to come. So what should the king do? Now that they're saying no, well, as the king, off with their heads, queen of hearts. I mean, he, he could do that. He, he could just, this is, you're humiliating me. You already said yes. What do you mean no? He has all authority as the king. So let's see what he does in the story. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Right, he's, look what he's doing. He's graciously pleading with them. And he's put on the best of the best, the fattened calf. That's Wagyu, everybody. That's the good stuff. He's like, I've, it's butchered. It's going on the grill. Do you want it rare, medium, rare? Those are the only two options, by the way, okay? If you order anything beyond that, I'm praying for you, okay? I was at Old Fields this week. I got a 22-ounce bone-in ribeye. I ordered it right, everybody. The fattened calf. Like, he's, he's like, it's all ready. I've prepared it. I invited you. You said yes. Now you say no, and I'm graciously pleading. Come. Come, come to the wedding banquet. Matthew goes on and says, but they paid no attention and they went off, one to his field and another to his business. And here's where we're going to look at Luke because Luke provides more detail here that Jesus told in the parable. He continues it. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still, another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Do you know what these are? Lame excuses. Not just excuses. Let me show you how lame they are. Let, let's go, go back there to, to verse 18. He says, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Bro, you bought the field before you saw it? What, what kind of a decision was that? It gets worse. Look at the next one. He says in verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. 
Like, you test drive these things. You don't take them off the lot until you know if they can pull what you need them to pull. And then the last one, I've just got married. Which, honestly, I mean, that's probably the most valid reason. His wife's not letting him go to this party. I mean, it's just, you can laugh there. It's a joke, everybody. Right? But what, what is this? Let, let's see what this really is. Beyond it being lame excuses, what it's showing us, remember, the point of parables is to show us what the kingdom of God is like and right now we're hearing that these people are more concerned with their kingdom than with his. They're more concerned with their business, with their luxuries, with their relationships than the kingdom of God. The king is inviting them to a wedding banquet for his son. And they're saying, no, no, I have to work today. I, I've, got, I've got to go look at this. I've got to go inspect this. But I already have this planned. You can see how the parables, if we have ears to hear— will poke in different parts of our lives to show us if we know the kingdom of God. And so these people make their excuses, and the king is insulted, remember, insulted by their refusal. It's no small thing to deny the king to a banquet, (laughs) to say, no, I'm not coming. He's insulted. So what he does next makes no sense because he's already humiliated, he's already dishonored, but look at what he's willing to do. Luke 14, the servant came back and reported this to the master. Hey, this guy's got a field. This guy's got oxen. That guy just got married. He's telling him. So the owner of the house became angry, rightfully so, and ordered his servant. Now look at the order. He doesn't order him, mobilize the army, get rid of them, bring my judgment on them for saying no to my invitation. He says, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Understand Jesus's audience would have been so confused when they heard this part of the story. Way more confused than you and I are. This is not a society that pays any attention to the marginalized and the forgotten. You know, one of the things I love about Blaze Church and what I continue to hear from people who come is I feel so welcomed when I come into this space. How many have felt that or said that before when you come here? Yeah, I mean, I just hear it over and over again through emails and conversations. I feel welcomed. All people, all people. In this society, welcoming that list was not Normal, And it certainly was not expected for a king to do that. Fill your house with the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Here's what the king is doing in his invitation. Remember, we prayed for ears to hear, so let's listen. The king is showing us something about his banquet. And here it is. An invite to this banquet is based on my status, not your status. That's the message the king is sending when he tells his servants, go invite the forgotten. Go invite those who are going to show up and they're not bringing a wedding gift. It's okay. Invite them. Bring them in. Tell them they're invited too. But how? They, They don't deserve to be here. Ah, an invitation to this banquet is based on me, not them based on who the king is. The king is willing to be humiliated in this moment so that all might be invited. Look at the next verse. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done, but there is still room. (laughs) We've We've told the poor, the crippled, the lame, you sent out the first invitation to those who seemed worthy, but there is still room. So, The master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and say this word with me and compel. Isn't that a beautiful word? Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Here's what I believe we need to take away from this parable this morning is that there's room in God's house for you. 
there's room for you no matter what your status is. There has been an invitation that's been sent and there's a compelling that is taking place. Even now in this moment, my prayer for you into this Sunday was that the Holy Spirit, who is the only one that can do this, would compel you in your heart to say yes to the invitation to come into God's house. And I'm not speaking come into this building or come into a church building, but to be a part of the kingdom of God, to recognize that your invitation has been sent because of the king's status, not because of your status. Do you have ears to hear the parable this morning? How beautiful it is that God is saying, come, come, come into my house. There's room. There's room. So the servants listened. The servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they could find. Notice this, the bad as well as the good. Can someone say amen there that you're thankful for that invitation? The bad as well as the good were invited in and the wedding hall was filled with guests. If you've ever thought or verbalized I'm not good enough for God, you're invited. Just this past Friday at Alive on 25, I had the beautiful opportunity to serve with the dream team and to speak with different individuals. And the phrase came up that's come up to me so many times before and maybe to you as well. Well, I'm just not religious enough for church. To which I say, don't worry, I'm not either. And they let me pastor. It's awesome. I'm not good enough. I'm not religious enough. If this was based on our merit and our status, none of us would receive an invitation from the king. It's not based on us. All are invited to come in. Now, with that, the parable does not end there. There's an important part that you and I need to see because maybe you're starting to wonder, well, if all are invited, then how come all don't say yes? then how come it doesn't seem like, does that mean and we can talk about the afterlife and eternity? Well, then do all just get in like it seems here? Jesus doesn't end the parable here. So again, ears to hear. I'm going to read the entirety of the parables ending now, and then we'll look at what Jesus has to say. So they've all been invited. Verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, and now he's walking around. Cocktail hour. He's scoping it out. Who's here? Uh, you're here. You said yes. This is awesome. He noticed a man there who was, say it with me, not wearing wedding clothes. Now, this is way deeper and way bigger than simply deciding I'm wearing jeans and a button down to a wedding. And if you do that, go on with your bad self. I respect it. This is, this is deeper than that. You're going to see. In this culture, when a wedding was put on, the host would provide the garments to the guests. You wore what the host provided. So here he comes in and sees that guy's not wearing the wedding clothes. Well, what happens? He asked him, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Notice the tone of the king, loving and gracious. You were invited. There was provision. I'm calling you friend, but how are you here without wearing what I provided? And he's speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Remember what we just saw in the video, the parables are not all happily ever after tales but they tell us about the kingdom of God. So here it is. The king sees a man not wearing what's been provided and says, you need to be bound up and cast out. And the imagery here is eternal separation, darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is language of the Hebrews that speak of eternity. And here's the next verse. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So, the parable ends. 
And if we would have ears to hear, we'll hear what this parable is saying to us regarding the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is God inviting all to come in, not based on your status, based on his. His grace, his love, his invitation. He's the one who sends the invite, and he pleads with us to come. He compels us to come. Invited. Well, then how do we know who are chosen? Who are those who are chosen? Well, what does the parable tell us? The wedding garment. There's been provision, and it's easy to identify those who are chosen by the wedding garment. You might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. What's not fair? He's God. He has graciously invited and compelled all to come in and has provided what's necessary, and yet we could reject his invitation, reject his wedding garment, and say, ah, I think I can do this on my own. I think I'm good enough. I think I'm okay without a full surrender to Jesus, a full acceptance of the invitation. And in our denial of his provision, we refuse, we refuse, our hearts refuse the invitation because it takes humility to say, I need to wear what you've provided for me, God. It takes humility to say, I'm not as good as I think I am. I'm not deserving of this invitation, let alone to attend. So let's talk about our clothes for a second, shall we? The prophet Isaiah has this to say about our good works, our best dressed behaviors and morals. He says in Isaiah 64, 6, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. On your best day, on my best day where I'm taking notice of my behaviors and I'm, I'm speaking life and I'm, I'm good, My own goodness, my own righteousness in the eyes of a holy God is nothing more than a filthy rag. It does nothing to remove my sin. It does nothing to cleanse me of my sin. I can't show up and say, hey God, did you see how good I am? Allow me into the wedding banquet. He will say, my friend, how did you get in here wearing that? It's filthy. And I provided something so much better through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Scripture says that we can be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin for us so that in him, not in ourselves, but in him, we might become the righteousness of God. This parable is the gospel that we are invited to know a holy God, but we are incapable of knowing in our own selves. But he provided Jesus so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There should be a stirring in our hearts right now to say, well then, how do I be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus? Is anyone, anyone's heart stirring in them to say, how might I be clothed? What then do I do? Well, if that's what you're saying, the Holy Spirit is working right now, compelling. And people asked that question on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago to Peter after he shared the gospel with them and told them, your good works are going to do nothing in the eyes of a holy God. They respond and say, well then, what should we do? And here's his answer and our answer today. Acts 2.38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are three beautiful things that Peter says here. The first, repent. To repent means to really have a change of mind, to change our direction. See, many of us, It's not that we're living such horrid lives that it's so obvious to us that we need Jesus. It's way sneakier than that. We need to repent of the reasons why we do good things. Did you ever think about that? See, what sin is at its core, the the best definition I heard of sin, is sin is forming your identity around anything other than the person and work of Jesus. 
So we might say the religious leader that Jesus was in his home that day as he told the story, he was in sin if he formed his identity around his morality and his goodness and his behavior. He was still in sin. And so what we do is we repent. We turn from our sin and we turn toward a gracious God, a God who says, I'm inviting you to come. And then there's baptism. Water baptism is symbolic of the transformation that has taken place. We are new creations. Paul writes in Corinthians that we identify with the resurrection power of Jesus through the waters of baptism. And he tells them that day, be baptized. Identify with this this new life that's been given to you by a gracious God. And we don't go at it on our own. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. How many are thankful that God doesn't call you to follow him on your own strength, but rather he says, I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Can we give God praise right now for the gift of the Holy Spirit? Like, I don't know about you, but me on my best day is nothing compared to the Holy Spirit on any day. He empowers us for Christ's exalting ministry to live a life that pleases him. Do you have ears to hear this morning? Are you hearing? You've been invited There's provision made by Jesus. We respond through repentance. And this Saturday, I'm so excited for our baptism celebration service. So this Saturday, July 9th at 9 a.m. is going to be water baptism. And I'm encouraging you that if you have yet to be water baptized, you've put your faith in Jesus, but you have not been water baptized This is for you. Notice Acts 2.38 didn't say repent and then a whole bunch of other stuff. It just said repent and be baptized. (laughs) Like I get so many people will say to me, Pastor Keith, I just don't think I'm ready for it. I'll ask him, do you know who Jesus is? Is the Lord and Savior of your life? Have you confessed your sins? Are you living for him? Yes, you're ready. Identify with the resurrection power that has saved you. Water baptism. And I'm excited because our summer baptisms are so fun. It's going to be outside at our church building. It's BYO chair, everybody. So bring your own chair, lawn chair, recliner, whatever you'd like, hammock, that's fine too. We're going to be hanging out outside, celebrating, worshiping God right there. It's kind of live on the lawn. Everyone remember live on the lawn, 2020 summer? Okay, we're doing that again. We're bringing it back for a day. Uh, We're going to have outdoor baptisms and... uh, ice pops. That was my request. Your pastor put that in, and it got approved. So there will be ice pops at nine in the morning. I figure it's never too early for sugar. Um, And so it's just going to be a whole lot of fun as we celebrate with people who are saying, God has made me new. I'm wearing the wedding clothes. I'm chosen. So here's my question for you this morning. Have you responded to the invitation that's gone out? God sent out this invitation through his son Jesus, that all who believe in him might be saved. All who call on his name. Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead, we will be saved. And right now, I want to invite you, if you have never called on his name, to do so this morning. To say, Jesus, I'm saying yes to the invitation. Some of you today, July 3rd, is the day where you're going to put on the wedding clothes You're you're brand new. You're born again. And July 9th is the day you're going to identify with that through water baptism. I mean, what a way to start your summer, knowing the king. And for those of you who are saying this morning as we start our series, I'm so grateful that God has invited me. Let me remind you, the yes that you made to Jesus is because he invited you. He loved first. Let there be no room for pride in our hearts as followers of Christ. May we walk humbly with our God. And may you then find yourself in the story as a servant sent out to compel others to come in. Because that's where we are in the kingdom of God. Here in this world, we are trailblazers inviting people to know the living hope that is Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me now as we pray and I want to intentionally ask you again, if you have yet to call on the name of the Lord, that you've never said, Jesus, be my Savior, or your heart's never been stirred the way that it's being stirred this morning by the Holy Spirit, as I pray, call on his name. Say, Jesus, 
Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for providing righteousness for me. I want to know you. I want to be made new. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you this morning for the parable that we've explored. To see your goodness, to see how you have invited, how you have compelled us to come and to know you and how you are the king of the banquet to celebrate your son, Jesus. And this morning, I pray for each person who's saying, I want to know God. I want to put my faith in him. I don't want to trust in my righteousness any longer. I don't want to wear filthy rags. I don't want to live apart from God. I'm saying yes to Jesus. Father, right now, you're hearing each prayer that's being made. You're hearing those who are saying, Jesus, I call on you. I confess my sin to you now. I believe that you died and you rose again to save me. I'm putting on the wedding garment that you've provided. Lord, I pray for those in this space who know you as Savior, that all of us would be the servants that go out and compel the good and the bad alike to come to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Lord, use Blaze Church this summer to blaze the way for people to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.